This is Bill McLeod from Winnipeg, Canada, bringing you a message on what I want to call all prayer. That phrase is found in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then Paul adds this, and for me, and for me, all prayer. To begin with, Romans 8.26 says, We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know what to pray for as we should. Okay, so that being true, then what do we do? Well, we, we ask the Holy Spirit to show us what we should be praying for, and he will do that. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8. Okay, first of all, there is serving God. And Anna, in Luke chapter 2, verse 20, uh, 37, she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. She served God with fasting and prayers night and day. So we can serve God by fasting. Fasting, you know, is praying without words. The Bible speaks about fasting, crying to God over in the Esther, the matter of the fastings and their cry. So when you're fasting, you're crying. It's praying without words. You're crying to God. And so she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And then the word persevering, Ephesians six eighteen, with all perseverance. That means never giving up. Genesis 32 gives us the example, you remember, of Jacob. How he prayed all night, wrestling with the angel of God, and find the angel said, "Let me go. The day is breaking." And he said, "I will not let you go unless you break, unless you uh, bless me." And so he was blessed. And so God changed the name from Jacob, which meant the supplanter or deceiver, uh, to Israel, which meant Prince of God, because God said, "You have power with God and with men." He prevailed with God, and I gave him power with men. Persevering, all perseverance. Thanksgiving, oh, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep, that is, it'll guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Which I don't think we should ever start praying without starting with thanksgiving abounding therein with thanksgiving, we read in Colossians chapter 2. I remember one time seeing some men, now they were not Christians, but they were fishing uh, in, on a June morning in a wilderness river, and there were probably a half a dozen men there, and uh, they said, if you want to catch a big walleye, stand over there, you'll catch one every second or third cast. If you want to, if you don't mind, if you'd like to have smaller fish, two and three pounds, stand here, you'll get one every cast. Men were literally filling baskets and big five-gallon cans with, with walleyes. Beautiful day, having a wonderful time catching the fish, and what else? They were cursing and blaspheming all the day. I never heard anything like it. I couldn't believe it, but that was unsaved men. And sometimes as Christians, we may not curse and blaspheme, but we have a, a sour heart. We're not thank, thankful to God. We're not rejoicing as we should. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul wrote, and again I say, rejoice. Christ said, don't rejoice because, you have sub because demons are subject unto you. Rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. There's that old song, written in heaven, O glorious thought. This consolation to me Christ has brought. So rejoice in the Lord always. Then Acts 6, 4, the apostles said, we will give ourselves, continue to prayer and to the ministry of the word, beginning with, with um, prayer and ending with ministry to others. Giving ourselves. So sort of the idea is throwing yourself into it with every ounce of energy you have. Give yourself to it. That's, a, that's Acts chapter 6, verse 4. And we're to strive together. Romans 15, 30, Paul says, striving together with me in your prayers to God for me. And the, the word strive there comes from a word which really means agonize. And so we're to strive together with Paul to agonize to prayer. Again, like I say, to, to give it all you can. 
And then 2 Corinthians 111 speaks about helping by prayer. You also helping together by prayer. You know, the Bible speaks about the gift of helps. I've never heard of any Christians convening a conference, inviting people to come so they could spend a weekend trying to discover what helps God had given them. No, that, I've ne it never happened. It, as far as I know, it's never happened. It probably never will. Well, people want to uh, find out about more flashy gifts, you know, on the platform stuff. And so they want to find out, they want to get the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy and all this kind of stuff. What about just having the gift of prayer? You also help me together by prayer. And then Paul spoke about travailing in prayer over in Galatians 4.19. He said, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. The churches in Galatia, Paul had been there before. They had been completely alive, praying much, witnessing much, giving much. He comes back some years later, and he sees they're all dead. And he said, you did run well. Who drove you back? Who hindered you? Who drove you back? What's happened here? And so Paul went to prayer, and he likened it to, having, to a woman having a child. He called it travailing in prayer. Travailing in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Isaiah 66, 8 says, As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. And Finney applied that to praying for, for souls to be saved. And he said, You can't, I can't, he said, I can't. I can't speak effectually to individuals or publicly to groups of people if I ever lose the spirit of prayer. And he made much of this, having the spirit of prayer, so that he could truly travail in prayer for the souls of others and for other matters. Finney made a great deal of this. I think we should do. Then the Bible speaks about us watching and waiting. In Colossians 4, 2, watching the same with thanksgiving. Watching and waiting, well, you know, it really means, means spending time. In Mark 13, 33 to 37, there are four such references. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, watch, watch. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So wait on the Lord. And dear people, listen. Wait in any language means wait. Wait on God. You know, in Isaiah 40, 31, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But wait on God. Wait on God. I had a friend, he, he taught psychology in university in Canada. He was a Christian. He came to me one time and said, um, Pastor, could you give me some books or recommend some books that would be helpful to me? And I said, yes. I suggested four books. Uh, two books on Spurgeon's life, the early years and the full harvest, and then the two-volume set done by Pastor Dallimore, a pastor from Ontario, on the life of George Whitfield. Well, he bought the ones on the life of George Whitfield, and his life was totally transformed. He might walk up to you in the church and say, would you uh, wait with me in prayer for a while? Now, if he asked you to do this, you have to think in, in terms of maybe two hours, you know. He was constantly waiting and watching on, with God. It was amazing. You rarely saw him in the church services. During the services, he'd be up there in the prayer meeting, which in that church overlooked the congregation, and he'd be up there praying the whole time, watching and waiting, waiting and watching. And he knew what that meant. He just spent hours at it and had a wonderful insight into into God, and as, into the works of God. And uh, so, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with eagles. They shall run. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a promise of God. Get to, alone with God. You've got to scrap the, the system you have now, your agenda, you know, doing, running here, running there, getting this done, doing something else, and rattling off a two-sentence prayer at the end of the day, or maybe starting the day with a one-sentence prayer, 
uh, people, that's an insult to God. Give God quality time, watching and waiting, and then laboring. It speaks about Epaphras in Colossians 4.12, and Paul said he was always laboring fervently for you in prayer. So it's work. It's hard work. Laboring fervently. It's hard partly because we are opposed. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against principalities and powers against what Paul called the rulers of the darkness of this world. They hate to see you praying. The devil is always at you if you spend a lot of time in prayer. But we overcome him through prayer, always laboring fervently in prayer, okay? Colossians 4.12. And then in Colossians 4.13, it speaks about this man, Epaphras, again. And Paul said, uh, I bear witness him, and he has great zeal for you in prayer. Great zeal. You know, somebody said, I know a Christian that's very zealous. Would you think in terms of some person who was praying? No, he's a zealous Christian. Oh, he's giving out tracts. He's a zealous Christian. He's always witnessing for Christ. He's a zealous Christian. He's tearing around the country holding meetings. No, no. Great zeal and prayer. Oh, people. This is what God is saying. And then the Bible speaks about people praying night and day. Psalm 88, 1. I've cried night and day, David said. I have cried night and day. First of Psalm 310, Paul said, Night and day, praying exceedingly that I might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your life. And so, night and day praying. Second uh, Timothy 1, 3, Paul said to Timothy, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Now people, it doesn't mean he's praying all night and all day. It's just a phrase he's using, demonstrating or illustrating that we should find ourselves, you know, prayer has been called the breathing of the soul in Lamentation 356. Do not hide your ear at my breathing, at my cry. Okay, so uh, prayer is a, is, is a matter of spiritually breathing. So we should pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. We should find ourselves praying constantly through each day. We don't have to be on our knees praying. We can be praying as we're driving in the car. We can be praying as we're studying a book. We can be praying as we're washing the dishes. We can be praying at our job, whatever it is. Praying in our hearts. Many examples in the Bible are praying in their hearts. Uh, the Eliezer, Abraham's servant, he prayed in his heart. And God gave him instant guidance, which was what he needed at that particular time. Nehemiah prayed standing before a king. And uh, so we can pray standing. And Jehoshua had prayed riding in a chariot. When he was faced with danger, he cried to God. So you can pray when you're driving your car. And Jonah, I'm sure he prayed in a horizontal measure because that's where he was in the fish's belly when he cried again to God. And God sent him free. All right, laboring fervently. Zeal, night and day, day and night. Then people, we have the wonderful example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 14, 23, he went up into a mountain apart to pray alone. Mark 1, 35, rising a great while before day, he prayed. Long before the sun was up, Christ was out there just praying. Luke 5, 16, he withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Luke 6, 12, he prayed all night before choosing the 12 apostles. And then Luke 9, 28 and 9, on the Mount of Transfiguration, with Peter, James, and, and John, he prayed, and Moses and Elijah showed up on the mountain. It was called the Mount of Transfiguration. It says that Christ was transfigured before the apostles. When they looked at him, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. That's why it was called a Mount of Transfiguration. So that's a wonderful example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, people, let's pick up on that. And then we have a wonderful example of other people, you know. Abel, Clary, and Father Nash, two Finney's helpers. When Finney was going somewhere for special meetings, 
and they found out about it. He would tell them, and they would take off and go to that place and rent a place to stay and start their prayer ministry. They prayed eight to ten hours a day. And they might be there a week or two weeks before Finney got there. And Finney said, when I got there, the prayer had already started, had already begun through the prayers of these men. There were some men called the Praying Men of Barvis in, in Scotland, and Duncan Campbell told me about them. He said, these men, they give up their job and uh, have supper and go to bed right after supper, and they sleep until 9 o'clock at night. Then at 9 o'clock they rise up and they pray until 2 o'clock in the morning. Then they go to bed and sleep until 7 when they get up to take care of their day's work or chores. Praying men. They did pardon me, they didn't meet together to pray. They just prayed. They loved to pray. And he told me something of their power in prayer because he'd gone to the Isle of Skye and I was interested in this story because that's where my the McLeod clan came from, the Isle of Skye. So he was trying to reopen a church that had been closed for years. He started on Sunday, five people showed up, nothing happened. Monday, five people, same five, nothing happened. Tuesday, Wednesday, nothing happened. Same people, five people. So we got a message to the praying men of Barvis, he said, asking them to take this need on their hearts. And they did. And after spending that night in prayer, the next night, there were 60 or 70 people showed up, and a revival began, and there were seven people, I believe he said, saved in that one meeting. And the church was reopened as a consequence. The praying men of Barbath, praying Hyde in India, you know, he he prayed constantly if the, if the on the compound where he stayed with other missionaries, when the dinner bell rang, he lifted his heart and said, God, do you want me to go for dinner or do you want me to continue praying? And if God said pray, he would stay and pray. He missed many meals this way. And then he began asking God for one soul a day, and God gave him one soul a day. And then he asked for two souls a day, then three souls a day. And I think he finally began asking for four souls a day. And he prayed and believed God, and God gave him what he asked for. You know, I was reading in one of Dr. Edwin J. Orr's books on um, revival about a Baptist church in the early 1800s, uh, wanted revival so bad. You know what they did? Listen carefully. They established three prayer meetings every day. One in the morning at seven, one in the afternoon, maybe two or three, and one in the evening. And uh, they continued this, three prayer meetings a day for two years. And then a mighty revival came, and hundreds of people found Christ as their Savior. Well, our text, Ephesians 6 to 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And Paul adds, and then, from me, because he said he wanted to open his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Are you into this thing called all prayer? Oh, I hope that you are. Praying with all prayer, serving God with prayer, persevering in prayer, praying with thanksgiving, giving ourselves to prayer, striving in prayer, helping others by prayer, travailing in prayer, watching and waiting in prayer. Hmm, laboring fervently in prayer, zealy, zealous in prayer, having great zeal in prayer, praying night and day, praying night and day, following the wonderful example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then following the wonderful example of others, Abel, Clary, and Father Nash, the praying men of Barve, praying Hyde, and that Baptist church, three prayer meetings daily for two years. And then revival came. Well, my dear friend, I've done my best today, and my best is not all that great. But listen, give yourself, continue to prayer. Give yourself to prayer. Pray without ceasing in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
So we read in First Thessalonians chapter 5, praying always, always, always. Perhaps what you should do at this point is get on your knees and ask God to forgive you for the poor prayer war you've been. Ask God to forgive you and, and to give you a gift of prayer and start setting aside time. If necessary, rise early in the morning. Give yourself an hour or two early in the morning. I heard a Christian worker whom God was mightily using, he said this, I decided to follow the example of Dwight L. Moody and Charles Finney rising at 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, I didn't want to get up before that was too early, so I started getting up at 7. I normally get up at 8. And then he said, I, that didn't do it, so I got up at 6, and that didn't do it, so I started getting up at 5, and that didn't do it, and finally I started getting up at 4, and that did it. And so it's just a challenge, dear people. Accept a challenge. Do something about it in this area of prayer. Everything depends on it in the work of God. We should know that. God bless you. Thank you. Amen.